This story covers the first 10 years in the afterlife of a California native coast live oak, which is now mostly dead. The story begins on El Día de los Muertos, November 1st, 2012, when I discovered that our majestic coast live oak had fallen to its death during the night. Now, 10 years later, the carcass is the center of a thriving habitat surrounded by other native plants and trees growing up and around it. Here's a closer look at what it looks like now from the east side looking to the west. This is the view from the south side looking to the north. In the foreground you see the bird bath that I created using the original branches from the tree that had fallen. Here's the view from the north side of the tree. Looking out at the carcass of the fallen giant occupying a good share of our backyard that morning, I was reminded of Judith Larner Lowry's musings on the importance of coarse woody debris. We will not see again the giants of old who, when they fell, were still taller prone than a tall man standing. The real consequences of the lack of coarse woody debris of substantial size in our forests won't be known for generations. Her words inspired me to save the carcass of this fallen oak. Here's the view from the base of the tree three days after it fell. Here you can see some of the massive canopy that was crushed by the fall. I put a yardstick next to the base of the stacked multiple trunks, which collectively measured more than three foot across. The arborist's diagnosis was that occluded bark between the multiple trunks of this oak resulted in poor attachment, which ultimately led to its demise. The oak was rooted over a foundation of rocks, some of which were deeply embedded within the base of the multiple trunks. Here's a picture that was taken more than five years later, after the native honeysuckle I had planted on the north side began to grow up the base of the trunk. Here's a closer look at the huge rocks that are embedded in the trunk. That fateful morning, our first priority was to save Dr. Hurd. I planted Dr. Hurd manzanita in 2006 after we moved in, but you can't see it in this picture because it was buried under the brush of the fallen giant. So first thing that morning, we got out the sawzall to cut away enough of the oak to rescue Dr. Hurd. Today, you would never guess that Dr. Hurd was flattened 10 years ago. Although it took several years of rejuvenation, now Dr. Hurd is thriving. Next, I hatched the plan to save the carcass of our fallen oak. My partner Chris thought I was crazy but I contacted Merlin Schollenberger of Merlin Arborist Group, who, knew about, who I knew about because he volunteers his time to help re-nest raptors for the Bird Rescue Center. He was completely on board and helped me with the hard part. I used orange flagging tape to mark where I thought cuts needed to be made to remove unstable portions of the tree. Merlin suggested a few modifications that enabled me to safely keep other interesting sections of the tree. 
Merlin and his colleagues also made extraordinary efforts to avoid further damaging Dr. Hurd and my Carpentaria Californica, as well as several volunteer madrone and toyon seedlings that had been buried under the fallen oak. Five years later, those rescued madrone seedlings were overtaking the carcass. And now they are more than 15 foot tall. Admittedly, it looked awful when the cutting was done. I told my partner, give me some time, it will look better. Although we kept as much of the carcass as we safely could, it still generated a lot of firewood. I also asked Merlin to save the tall spire of the oak on which I wanted to mount a flicker nesting box. Only later did I learn that flickers don't generally nest here. Instead, they leave to nest up in the Mayakamas Mountains. I say that the tree is mostly dead because it turned out that part of the multi-trunk tree still had intact cambium. In the spring of 2013, the bottommost trunk started regrowing. When I told Merlin, he asked if I wanted him to cut off its life supply. I told him, no, I prefer let's let nature take its course. One year after its fall, we can see some regrowth of the living section of the oak. In addition to the rescued plants, I also added a number of other California natives around and amongst the carcass of the oak. Here it is a year and a half later. The rescued toyon and madrone seedlings are in the bottom right corner. The picture on the bottom right shows the planted Festuca californica is thriving while Roger's red wild grape is taking root behind it. Here it is after three years. You might notice that the flicker box has disappeared. I decided that no flicker was going to use it for nesting, so I moved it to another living oak in our yard where it would have some shade. I thought it might serve as a nice nesting box for a western screech owl, which we occasionally hear at night. Sadly, I don't think any bird has ever used it for nesting. After five years, the rescued Dr. Hurd recovered and had grown much larger. By this time, the trunk that remained alive was continuing to regrow and other plants were helping to fill in and provide shelter for an entire village of California quail, as well as numerous other birds and critters that regularly take advantage of the habitat. After the October 2017 wildfires, I worried that the Orcar oak tarkus might represent a fire hazard. But Merlin reassured me that decaying wood like this would not would, would smolder rather than burn easily. The native honeysuckle that I had planted on the shadier north side of the tree was now climbing up and around the trunks by five years later. And the Rogers Red Wild Grape and Island Snapdragon were also beginning to grow up the fungus colonized trunk. More than six and a half years later, wild grape was thriving. Meanwhile, fungi and lichen were colonizing the carcass. Friends tell me that the main fungi colonizing our fallen oak is false tricky tail. Merlin initially suggested that we inoculate the carcass with oyster mushrooms, but I decided to let nature take its course. As our fallen coast live oak here entered the eighth year of its afterlife, the fungi continued to do their job colonizing it. And here's a final look at the fungi now, 10 years later. After the oak fell, I harvested some of the original branches to make a bird bath stand. The birds love to frolic amongst the habitat created by this fallen oak and its accompaniment of plants. Sometimes I see multiple species of birds queuing up along the branches of the carcass, waiting patiently for their turn at the bird bath. Rub-a-dub-dub, four chestnut back chickadees in a tub. The chickadees show up at the birdbath every summer as soon as the winter rains dry up. I think they must wait. I think they must drink their weight in water every day because they monopolize the bath. Crow likes to wash his food in the bath. Sometimes he leaves leftovers. One day I found the head and first four inches of a snake. 
The next day, I found the leg of a lizard. Another day, I found that the bird bath was full of soggy chunks of bread. The critter cam helped me identify the culprit, and so I have a few pictures here I captured. Mr. Crow is not the most considerate user of the bird bath. On this particular day, California Toey was enjoying her bath. But then, an acorn woodpecker showed up. He perched on the end of the oak branches above the bird bath. Initially, Toey appears ready to take flight. After a couple seconds, Toey begins to reconsider. Another 10 seconds later, Toey decides to return to her bath. Apparently, Toey is not going to let Mr. Woodpecker interfere with her bath. Toey won the Battle of the Bird Bath that day. Hooded Orioles are less frequent visitors, but we sometimes see them here during nesting season. In this case, it was May of 2016. The bath gets many other visitors. Here we see pictures of lesser goldfinches, an oak titmouse, a northern flicker, and a stellar's jay. Never doubt that birds like a good back bath. This here show we see some pictures of a very wet woodpecker, acorn woodpecker, and also a California scrub jay, which loves to splash around in the bath. Sometimes I see birds that get so saturated with water that they hardly seem able to fly themselves from the bird bath to the nearby living coast live oak where they can take refuge while they dry off. Of course, birds are not the only ones that need water. By September of 2020, the original branches that were holding up the bird bath were failing, so I had to rebuild a new one. Fight habitat loss, one backyard at a time. We needn't rush to dispose of trees that initially appear dead. Even if it does, doesn't survive, don't overlook the potential habitat value of a tree in its afterlife. Special thanks to Merlin Schellenberger, who didn't think I was crazy when I told him what I wanted to do. Thanks also to Philip Van Solen and Sherry Althaus at California Flora Nursery for their advice and wonderful selection of native plants. And most importantly, I thank my partner Chris for his putting up with my harebrained ideas. Finally, I thank Judith Leonard Lowry for her writings that inspired me to keep this fallen oak as part of my landscaping. The lasting quality of large fallen trees creates stable habitats in which large woody debris accumulates. Large fallen trees in such an area often contact each other physically, creating external habitats of intense biological activity. Their tenure on the forest floor could be as long as 400 to 500 years.